Hello everyone, welcome to Barca News. It is January 9th, 2024, and today we're gonna be talking about Rafinha, his statistics, and how do they compare to other players all across the world. We have a lot to discuss, so let's begin. Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. My name is Mo and today's video is gonna be a little bit different in where I'm not gonna be talking about the news, but instead I'm gonna be talking about Barcelona's winger Rafinha, his statistics and how they compare to other wingers around the world. Now the reason I decided to make this video is that I've been getting a lot of comments claiming that given Rafinha's numbers, not only is he one of Barcelona's best players, but also he's one of the best wingers in all of Europe. And I've also this, seen this claim being repeated through social media on Twitter. And I've even seen YouTubers make videos repeating this claim. So I decided to do a little bit of digging, a little bit more research, and look into Rafinha's numbers and see whether he's indeed one of the best wingers in Europe. Now during this 2023-2024 season, Rafinha has scored a total of four goals and provided seven assists in all, all across the competitions. So this means the Champions League, La Liga, and Copa del Rey. And he has played a total of 951 minutes, meaning that Rafinha is currently has, has a scoring ratio of one goal every 238 minutes. And that's a goal contribution every 86.5 minutes. Now this is the number that most people are relying on when they're making the claim that Rafinha is one of the best wingers in Europe. So of course this raises the question, does a one goal every 238 minutes and one goal contribution every 86.5 minutes mean that Rafinha is one of the best attackers or best wingers in Europe? Well, the answer is a resounding no. Now, in order to do a correct assessment of how good a player is, you must do both a quantitative and a qualitative analysis. When it comes to quantitative analysis, as the name suggests it, it's an analysis based on numbers, things like how many goals and assists a player has, versus the qualitative analysis is something based or analysis based on things that cannot be quantified. Things like how good, how smart a player is, how good of a dribbler the player is, how good is he reading the plays, how good is he interpreting the field, how good is his positioning is, how good is he attacking the empty space, how much fear does he inspire in the opposing team, and things like how predictable or unpredictable the player is and how much of a difference maker he is. These are things that cannot be quantified but are very important to consider when correctly analyzing whether a player is good or not. Now, in order to get a full picture of how good the player is, you must do both types of analysis. The problem is that most people only do quantitative analysis. Why? Because it's easy, right? Quantitative analysis is something like player A has five goals, player B has three goals, therefore player A is better. That's pretty easy. Anybody could do that. But when it comes to qualitative analysis, not everyone can do it. It's something that's much, much more difficult. And that is why clubs spend millions and millions of euros on scouting departments, because unlike the most of us, scouts are gifted with that ability of doing qualitative analysis and seeing things in players that most of us cannot see and therefore correctly determine whether a player is good or will be good. Now, if all we needed was how many goals or how many assists a player has in order to determine how great he is, we wouldn't need scouting departments, we wouldn't need sporting directors, we wouldn't need coaches going through hours and hours of tapes watching players. All we would need to do is spend a few seconds Googling who has the most goals and assists, and voila, you have your best player, go ahead and sign him. But that is not how things work. Because in order to correctly assess how good a player is, again, you must do a quantitative and a qualitative analysis because you're not gonna get the full picture if you only do one or the other type of analysis. Now, a big example of that, let's look at Sergi Roberto. Sergi Roberto this season has scored three goals and provided one assist in La Liga and has played a total of 357 minutes. That means that Sergi Roberto is scoring one goal every 190 minutes and is providing a goal contribution every 89 minutes. Those numbers are better than Rafinha's. Does that mean that Sergio Roberto is better than Rafinha? Does that mean that Sergio Roberto is one of the best attackers in all of Europe? Of 
course not. That's a resounding no. Another great example of what happens when you only look at numbers. Let's take Martin Braithwaite. During his final season in Barcelona, he scored two goals and provided one assist, playing a total of 248 minutes. So that's one goal every 124 minutes and one goal contribution every 82 minutes. Those numbers are also better than Rafinha's. Does that mean that Martin Braithwaite is better than Rafinha or that he's one of the best attackers in Europe? The answer is also a resounding no. So looking at goals and assists does not give you a full picture and does not truly assess what, how great a player is. But since people who are always defending Rafinha are always insistent on looking at the numbers, let's look at the numbers and let's truly see how his numbers compare to the rest of Europe. Because all of you already know my opinion about Rafinha. I've been saying it since last season. I think Rafinha is not a Barca level player. I think he's a mediocre player at best. He's a good player for a mid to bottom table team. He was great at Leeds, and I'm sure he'll be great at another club that's mid to bottom table team. But he is not Barca level because he cannot dribble past defenders. He is not a difference maker. He's not a player that can change the outcome of a match. And he is an incredibly predictable player, so therefore does not inspire fear in opposing teams. When Rafinha has the ball, opposing teams will send only one defender to mark him because they know exactly what's going to happen. He's either going to attempt a dribble and lose the ball, or he's going to pause, make a back pass or a side pass. So I don't think Rafinha is Barca level. I don't think he's one of the greatest players in all of Europe. But of course, don't take my word for it. Let's look at statistics and let's look at actual numbers and how Rafinha's numbers compare to the rest of Europe. Now, the numbers I'm about to show you are from the International Center for Sports Studies, or CIES, as it's known by its acronym. If you don't know what CIES is, it's an independent educational and statistical organization. It's pretty much an organization dedicated to the study of football. It's full of scientists whose only job is to collect as much data as possible about football players, analyze and study that data, and then produce reports. Now the way CIES operates, they look at all the different metrics, not just goals and assists. They look at things like pass accuracy, passes completed, dribbles, tackles, all of that. But not only do they look at all these different factors, they also assess the difficulty of these completed factors. So for example, when we're talking about goals, not all goals are created equal. There's a difference between a goal where I, for example, get the ball in the middle of the field, dribble past five defenders, dribble past the goalkeeper and score, versus my teammate doing all that, dribbling past all the defenders and goalkeeper, passing it to me and me pushing the ball in, right? Those are two different goals. They require two different skills, require much two different levels of difficulties. And not just with goals, but with passes too. For example, there's a difference between Messi's pass in the World Cup, where he was running one way, passes the ball the opposite way and goes past four defenders, versus a pass where let's say I'm in my own box, no opposing players around me, and I just pass it to my teammate that's right next to me, right? Because technically I can do that all day and have a 100% accuracy, pass accuracy, and that statistic would be hugely misleading. So CIES takes all of that into consideration as well, not only all the factors, but the difficulty of the factors and also the difficulty of the opponent. Because scoring a goal against Manchester City in the final of the Champions League, it's not the same as scoring a goal against Barbastro who are in fourth division. So what I'm trying to say is that CIES have a very sophisticated and complex metrics where they study and analyze all types of data and then they produce these reports. These are professionals who know what they're doing and this is not just a random person on Twitter who added the goals, added the assists, divided them by the minutes played and voila, came up with an argument. Now having said all that, let's look at the CIES report about right wingers in all around the world. And let's look at the top 10 players that they have selected. Now, if you look at the list, we have a top, Bukayo Saka, followed by Mohamed Salah, Phil Foden, Riyad Mahrez, Xavi Simmons, Jared Bowen, Zion Arias, Leroy Sané, Takafusa Kubo, and Nicolas Gonzalez. Now, where is Rafinha on this list? Well, he's not. Why? Because Rafinha is not a top right winger. Not in the world, not in Europe, not in La Liga. He's a best, again, a mediocre player who's good for a mid to bottom table team. But what's going on with all these people defending him is that they're only looking at only one side of the coin. They're only doing a 
quantitative analysis and they're forgetting about the other side of the coin which is the qualitative analysis. And when you only do one of the two analyses, you're only getting a part of the picture and therefore you are arriving at the wrong conclusion.